16. Amen. Our burden soul found liberty at Calvary. Amen. Well, today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of the Passion Week that ultimately culminates there on the cross of Calvary on Good Friday, and then we'll be celebrating, of course, next week the resurrection of Christ on the first day of the following week, um, God's eternal plan playing out. And I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles out this morning and turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 23. If you didn't bring your Bible with you today, there's some in the little shelf thing in the seat in front of you. If you don't have one, feel free to take one out, take it home with you. That's what they're there for. We're going to be in Luke's Gospel, chapter 23 this morning. And as we have moved now into the Passion Week, you remember last week and this week, we're looking at some of the key events of that Passion Week. And we're asking this question as we look at them. Why do we know about these things? Remember, we talked last week a little bit about the fact that, that John reminds us that, that what we have in the pages of the Gospels represent a very small percentage of the things that Jesus said or did while he was on this earth. And the question is, why do we know about these specific events? Of all the things that God could tell us about, all the things he could inspire his writers to let us know about during the Passion Week, why these specific events? This morning we're looking at that interaction between Jesus and the two thieves on the cross there at Calvary. It's pretty unremarkable that the Romans would be crucifying criminals on a cross. It was a pretty common occurrence in that day. The Romans were a pretty barbaric society and it was a pretty common thing. That's unremarkable in itself. And there was enough going on on the, the cross of Jesus that if this account hadn't been included, if God hadn't... In, used through his Holy Spirit, inspired his writers to tell us about this account, we wouldn't have missed it. It wouldn't have taken anything away from that day, anything away from what was happening on Calvary. There was enough going on on the cross of Jesus. There was the mocking of the crowds. As they gathered around, they hurled insults at Jesus. They mocked him. They, they shook their fists. They spit at him. There's no record they were speaking to the thieves on the cross. They were only speaking to Jesus. That was going on around the cross of Christ. There were those seven statements that Jesus makes from the cross. Seven profound and powerful statements that he makes from the cross. That was going on. The temple, the veil in the temple was torn in two as, as Christ hung there on the cross. Matthew's gospel tells us there was an earthquake. The rocks split apart. The, the tombs opened up and the dead came to life as Jesus hung there on the cross. There were three hours of darkness. There was enough going on just with what was happening in that center cross that if we heard nothing about the other two, we wouldn't miss one single bit of that event. And so we ask the question, why then? Does God include this brief, that, that encounter between them, six sentences between them? Probably took a minute, maybe two tops. And the question then is, why would God include this brief, almost insignificant encounter in the light of everything else that's going on? This is a pretty insignificant event. Why would God include that? And what I want us to look at, I think, is five things that we see, five characteristics of God that we see on display because of this event. In the course of this event, God displays certain aspects of his characteristic. I want us to notice five of those this morning. First thing is the justice of God. We see a display of the justice of God as we see this account. Verse 32 of Luke chapter 23. Two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. Now, Luke's description of these guys is pretty nondescript. He calls them just criminals. And I mentioned the fact that the Roman society was pretty barbaric. They used crucifixion pretty often. It was a pretty common thing for them to do. They would crucify everything from punishing runaway slaves to all the way to the most barbaric murderers. And it's hard to get a sense for by how Luke describes these guys, just where they fell on that spectrum. Why is it they were there? What was their crime? His description doesn't help us a whole lot. Matthew and Mark both use the same word to describe these guys. It's often translated in English as robbers or thieves. And that gives us a little better idea of why these guys were there. But even that word falls a little short, really, of who these guys were. 
That word that is used there in Matthew and Mark's gospel to describe these guys, it's the same word that Jesus used as he, as he told the parable of the Good Samaritan. Those guys who attacked the guy on the road, and they didn't just rob him. They didn't just take his stuff. They, they brutally beat him, almost beat him to death. And that's the same word that, that is used here to describe these guys that were on the cross. It wasn't used for a shoplifter, some petty pickpocket or a cat burglar that sneaks into your house in the middle of the night. It wasn't used for a petty criminal. It was used for somebody who used violence as they stole beatings or even murder. That's the way the, the word was used. It's also the word that's used to describe Barabbas. Remember, he was the guy, the, the criminal that was let go in, instead of Jesus. And this word is used to describe him. Mark tells us a little bit about Barabbas. He tells us that Barabbas was a, an insurrectionist, a revolutionary, who murdered in the course of, of advancing his political agenda. Today we would call Barabbas a terrorist. And that's the other meaning of this word. Someone who employs violence to advance a political cause. And we don't really know which these guys were. Were they thieves who, who beat people and killed people in the course of carrying out their crime? Were they terrorists? What we do know is they were horrible, hardened criminals. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons we're told about these guys there. One of the reasons we're told about this event is it's a reminder of God's justice. There are times in this life when it seems like justice is not served. There are times in this life where it seems like people get away with things, right? And we, and we come to the point at, at times we, we see evil happening around us. And we can come to the place where we're like Job or the psalmist or the prophet Jeremiah. We ask God the question, why do the wicked prosper? We say, God, where is your justice in the midst of of those things. We don't know how long these guys had been criminals. We don't know how many lives they had destroyed, how many lives they had wrecked in the, in the course of their crime spree. And many of those that were their victims, they probably were not there that day. There was nothing said toward these men on the cross, nothing recorded that was said about them. Many of their victims were probably not there. You remember, this was the day before the 24-hour news cycle, before the Internet, where as soon as something happens, it pops up and we can know about it. They would have had no way to know that these criminals had been captured, let alone convicted and were being crucified that day. Many of their victims may not have been there. They wouldn't have known justice was being served. And I think there's something in that for us to see that the, the justice of God is on display. We don't always see it. We don't always see when justice happens in this world, but it's a reminder that it, we can be certain of, and even if we don't know about it, even if we don't see it. Paul said this in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. He's speaking for God, speaking of God. Never take your own revenge. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. And that word that Paul uses there, vengeance, it means to hand out justice. And we very well could plug that in. Justice is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. And there are times in this life where we're not necessarily going to see the justice of God carried out. But we see those two criminals on the cross on Jesus' left or right, and we're reminded the justice of God is certain, either in this life or in the life to come. The repentant thief, he, he notices it. He says to the other one, don't you even fear God? He recognizes there is an aspect, regardless of what happens to us in this life, the justice of God is certain. The Hebrew writer said this in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. He said, it is appointed for man once to die, and then the judgment. And we come to this, we see this event, and it's a, a display of God's justice for us, a stark reminder that either here in this world or in the next life, the justice of God is absolutely certain. It's also a display, though, I think, of the sovereignty of God. There's a, a stark contrast that happens on that hill of Calvary. That's the Latin name for that hill. Golgotha is the Hebrew name. There's a stark contrast that happens on that hill that day. 
There are the, the two crosses on the right and the left, criminals who are, who are being handed down just as they deserve to be there. It's the contrast of the cross in the center. There's absolutely nothing just about Jesus being on the cross. That's not God's justice on display. That's God's sovereignty on display. Pick it up in verse 34 of Luke chapter 23. But Jesus was saying to them, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his, their, his garments among them. And the people stood by looking on. Even the rulers were sneering at him, saying he saved others. Let him save himself if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now, there was also this inscription above him that said, this is the king of the Jews. Sovereignty is one of those 50 cent seminary words, right? And this is what it means with respect to God, that God is in charge of everything and every person. Every event that has ever happened, God is sovereign. God is in charge. Every person, every ruler, every king, every president who has ever served in this world, God is ultimately in charge. The sovereignty of God means that nothing happens in this world that God doesn't either, either cause or allow. He is absolutely sovereign for every event in this world. To include this one. Remember I said last week that the, the cross of Christ, that center cross, Jesus going there to die for our sins, that was not plan B. That was ordained from God before he spoke anything into existence. Jesus was the lamb who was crucified before the foundation of the world. God didn't think up the cross on the fly. That was always his plan, his sovereign plan to deal with the sin of man that he knew was going to come. That was always his plan. The cross was not plan B. It happened when God chose for it to happen. Jesus said, no one takes my life. I lay it down willingly. I will give it. No one will take it from me. Over and over again, as Jesus interacted with his disciples, as this time drew near, he said this phrase, the time is at hand. There was a specific timing of when this was going to happen, so that when Christ died on that cross, it coincided with the slaughter, with the sacrifice of the Passover lamb, the perfect lamb of God being sacrificed for the sin of the world. This happened at God's timing. He chose when this would happen. He chose where this would happen. As Jesus had those conversations with his disciples, the time is at hand. One of those opportunities, we're told in John's gospel, he set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. That's where it was to happen. Jerusalem, where all of these pilgrims had come for the Passover to sacrifice that lamb. Jerusalem, the center of the worship life of the Jews, God's people, that's the place happened when God chose. It happened where God chose. And this event, Jesus dying on the cross for us, happened how God chose. This entire Calvary event, entire Friday event, six hours that Jesus hung on the cross, Luke's gospel, the way he reports it, fulfills 30-some Old Testament prophecies about this one event and this interaction between Jesus and the, the thieves on the cross. Verse 33 tells us he was crucified with two criminals. 700 years before this event, the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 12 said this, that the Messiah, as he would be sacrificed, would be numbered with transgressors. That the Messiah would be crucified, would be killed with criminals 700 years before this event took place. Verse 34 says that as Jesus was there on the cross, the soldiers were casting lots for his clothing. Kind of throwing dice, playing this game of chance. Who's going to get to take the clothing off of this dead man? Psalm 22, 18 a thousand years before Bethlehem, a thousand years before Jesus walked this earth, David prophesied Psalm 22:18. that's exactly what would happen as the Messiah 
died, the soldiers would be casting lots for his clothing. Verse 35 and 36 talk about the crowd, the, the insults, the mocking. Again, Isaiah 700 years earlier, Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, talks about that happening as the Messiah would, would die for the sins of the world. The last part of verse 36, the soldiers give him sour wine. They think it's a joke. They think it's all funny. It's a mocking thing for them to do. It's a fulfillment of prophecy in, Isaiah, or in Psalm 69, verse 21. And even down to the exact words they spoke. Verse 37, Luke gives us some of the words that they spoke as they hurled their insults at Jesus. If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Matthew records some other words. He trusts in God. Let, he, let God rescue him if he delights in him. Those exact words spoken by the crowd, David prophesied in Psalm 22. Those would be the exact words the crowd would speak to the Messiah. And even that sign above his head in verse 38, this is the king of the Jews. Pilate had that sign made. Pilate, the, the governor that ultimately was the one that sent Jesus to the cross, made that decision. Pilate had that sign made. Pilate didn't care about the Jews. Pilate didn't care about God. Pilate didn't care about God's law, but he had that sign made a fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah talking about who the Messiah would be in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, says that he would be of the root of Jesse, the line of David, the king of the Jews. Everything that happened in that account was under the sovereign hand of God when it happened, where it happened, how it happened. Jesus' crucifixion was not some event that just escalated too quickly. Well, that got out of hand pretty quick. It wasn't an event that escalated too quickly. It wasn't something that just spun out of control. His work there on that cross and this interaction between him and the thieves demonstrates for us the sovereignty of God. Demonstrates the sovereignty of God. Demonstrates the justice of God. It's a display of the righteousness of God. Verse 39. Now one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him. Saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuked him and said, don't you even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And indeed, we are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Verse 33 reminds us of the position of those crosses on that hill. It tells us that on his left and his right were the, the criminals. Jesus was right there in the middle. And that tells us that both of those thieves had equal access to Jesus. One didn't have to talk over the other to get to him. They both had equal access to Jesus. They saw the exact same things that day, both of them. They heard the exact same thing. Their experience, both of those thieves, their experience on the cross was exactly the same. They both had the same opportunity to respond to Christ. And that first thief, that first thief, he's a, he's a picture of the, the spiritually destitute, the, the worldly man, the sinner that is in all of us. It doesn't really seem to matter to him that he's getting what he deserves. It doesn't seem to matter to him that he ought to be there. That's exactly the place he should be for the things he's done. That doesn't seem to matter to him in the least bit. To him, right and wrong and praise and blame, good and bad, those are of no interest. He's interested in one thing and one thing only, and that is saving his skin. And that's the sinful man in all of us. And he's a, he's a picture of that spiritually destitute, worldly Man, he might even believe that Jesus might be the Messiah. He might even believe the words on the sign that Jesus maybe is the king of the Jews. But for him, it's a matter of convenience. What can I get from this Jesus? That's all he cares about. Can this Jesus get me down off of this cross? That's all he cares about. There's no spirit of brokenness. There's no guilt. There's no humility, there's no repentance among that first thief. 
And how does Jesus respond to him in verse 39? That's a bit of a trick question. How does Jesus respond to him in verse 39? He doesn't. He doesn't say a word. He doesn't respond to that thief, not in the least bit. And I think what we see in that is the, the righteous response of God to the unrepentant heart. What is the right response to someone who shakes their fist in God's face? What is God's right response to that person? The world is full of those who, who rail against God in self-righteousness, who come to God and demand that the creator of the universe owes me something. The world is full of people like that. That God is somehow obligated to them. But what is the right response? That's what it means, the righteousness of God. It means that God will always do what is right. What's the right response of God? To the, to the one who flaunts God's law. What is the right response to God? Who, for one who goes through this life with blatant disregard for who God is. Blatant disregard for what he expects of us. What's the right response of God? To one who goes through life like that, and like this first thief, isn't the least bit sorry. What's the right response of God? Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, Isaiah said this. But your iniquities have separated you from God. That's the right response of God. That we are separated from him because of our sin. That's the righteous response of God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. That's the right response of God to the unrepentant heart. Listen to how Isaiah finishes that verse. He will not hear you. That's the right response. That's the righteous response of God. How does Jesus respond to the unrepentant thief on the cross? In righteousness. He will not hear. And I'm here to tell you today that if you want God to hear you, if you want God to, to respond to you, if you want the, the promise that he makes to that other thief of being with him in paradise, if you want those things to be real in your life, you don't come to him on your terms. You don't come to him and demand that God is obligated to give me something. I don't need to repent. I don't need to, to be, feel sorry or guilty or anything about my sins. God's obligated to me in some way. If we want to come to God, we want a response from God. We want to hear him look at us and say, you will be with me in paradise. You come to him on his terms. You don't come to him on your own. And a heart that recognizes that he's a sinner. I deserve nothing from you, God. I deserve you to turn your face away and not hear me. That's all I deserve. The one that recognizes he's a sinner and deserve, deserves nothing, but cries out to God for mercy, that's the one that God hears. That's the one that God responds to. We see this interaction between Jesus and that first thief on the cross, and we see a display of the righteousness of God. We also see a display, though, of the mercy of God. That's not where the story ends. God would be perfectly right if the story ended right there, that every one of us deserves to be separated from him for all of eternity. Every one of us deserves for God to turn his face from us and not hear us. That's what every one of us deserves. And God would be perfectly in his righteousness to end the story right there. But he doesn't end the story right there. This interaction on the hill of Calvary, that Friday morning is a display of God's mercy verse 42. And he was saying, that's the second thief. He was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. This is an astounding display, I think, by any account. You think about that guy's life. Here's this, this hardened criminal or a, a violent terrorist on that cross. You think about who that guy was. He's heard the, the mocking influence of probably who was his partner in crime. That's probably why they were crucified together. He's heard his influence. He's heard the, the insults of the crowd. Might be hard not to get caught up in that, all the fervor that's going on around the cross. 
And he's got his own hardened heart to deal with. And in spite of all of that, In spite of all of that that's going on, in spite of who he is on the inside, in spite of all of that, he recognizes his own sinfulness. He recognizes that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. Jesus' kingdom is a heavenly one. And there's only one way I can get there. And that's not certainly because of what I've done. That's not because of what I deserve or what I bring to the table. There's only one way I can get into his kingdom. Jesus, I'm desperate for you to remember me. It's a remarkable display of his faith. I think what's even more amazing is Jesus' display of mercy at that point in time. That thief recognized, he calls it right. What do we deserve, he says to the other thief? We're, We're here rightly on these crosses. What did this man deserve? Exactly what he was getting. Both of those thieves, that's what they deserve, right? Exactly what they were getting, both in this life and in the next. He said to the other thief, don't you even fear God? Listen, these things that we've done that we're being punished for, this punishment on this cross, as horrible as it is, small potatoes to what we deserve when we cross over to the other side. And what did they deserve? Exactly what they were getting. In many ways, that's just like us, right? What do we deserve? Exactly whatever it is that we would get. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. There is none righteous, not even one. You say, I'm not as bad as that guy. I didn't do those things. I never killed anybody. Hopefully, you would say that. I'm not a, I'm not a hardened criminal. I'm not as bad as this guy. There is none righteous, not even one. None who understand, none who seek after The reality is that none of us deserve any better. None of us deserve heaven. None of us deserve for Jesus to turn to us and say, today you will be with me in paradise. None of us deserve that. And there's no record that this guy ever got off the cross, did a bunch of good things to counteract the the bad things he has done. No record that ever took place. His list of good deeds in his life is probably pretty short. And there's no record that he got down and did stuff to counteract that. And yet with authority, based on nothing but his profession of faith and who he believed Jesus to be, Jesus with authority turns to him and says, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Not, we'll see. You know what? When you cross over, we'll put your good works out, we'll put your bad works out, and we'll just see whether you'll be with me in paradise. That's not the way Jesus phrased it. He didn't say one day, perhaps, after you've been in purgatory and you've had a chance to work all that stuff off, then maybe you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't say it that way. Today, that moment you cross over based on what? All of his good deeds? Unlikely. Based on his profession of faith and the mercy of God, today you will be with me in paradise. Paul said it this way, Titus 3, verse 5, Not by works of righteousness we have done, but according to his mercy, God saves us. That's one of the reasons I think we're told about this story. We see God's justice on display. We see his sovereignty on display. We see his mercy on display. We see a display of the love of God. That whole scene on Calvary's hill tells us the lengths that God will go for us. The lengths that God will go to buy us back. To purchase our our opportunity to be in heaven with him. That scene on Calvary's hill shows us God's love. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, like these guys on the cross, completely undeserving, Heart of heart, totally self-absorbed. And while we were like that, while we were like them, Jesus died to demonstrate God's love for us. That cross of Calvary, that scene on Calvary's hill shows us the lengths God will go for us. Even before his profession of faith, even before this interaction took place, even before that second thief said one word, to Jesus. Notice what he said in verse 34. 
And Jesus was saying, that indicates he was saying over and over and over, Father, forgive them. This scene on this hill, this that plays out in front of us as a demonstration of God's love for us. A couple weeks ago, Jeannie and I were at the International Baptist Convention's Ministry Leadership Conference. And the, the, the speaker for that time was Richard Blackaby. Many of, you, many of you have heard of the Bible study, Experiencing God. Richard's father, Henry Blackaby, wrote that Bible study. And Richard is the oldest son, and he was the speaker for that event. This is what he said, one of the things he said. He said, the limits you place on what you believe God can do reveals how small your God is. He said, if you believe that God could do all things except this one, it reveals how small your God is. And he said, how small is your God if you come to the point and say, God could save all people except that one? As we see this interaction, we see this, this taking place there on the cross, on the hill of Calvary, this interaction between Jesus and that second thief. We see an event that say, if God's love can reach a guy like that, God's love can reach you. You know how when they interview the neighbors of a convicted criminal, they all say the same thing, right? Oh, I never saw that coming. Man, he was such a nice guy. I never would have suspected that. You, you get the sense looking at these guys that no, none of his neighbors would have said that. They would have said, yeah, I saw that coming. That guy's one of the most horrible people I've ever met. That doesn't surprise me in the least bit to see him up on that cross. You get the idea that's what these kind of guys are. And this event tells us that if God's love can reach him, if God's faith and God's mercy and God's grace can cover him, God's grace can cover you and me. There's a story of a little boy who carved a little boat out of a block of wood. And he was absolutely worked. He put his, poured his heart and his soul into this little boat and he, and he waited patiently for the rain to come. And finally it did, and he ran outside, and he, and he dammed up the water in the, in the gutter so he could play with his boat. And after a few minutes of playing with it, the, the water pushed all the leaves and the sticks out of the way. It broke the little dam he made. And his boat sailed down the gutter and right, went right down the storm drain. He was devastated, heartbroken. He would poured himself into making this little boat. A couple weeks go by, and he passes this toy store, and he sees in the window his little boat. And he blasts through the door, the door of the toy store. He says, that's my boat. That's my boat. I want my boat. The shopkeeper said, well, you'll have to buy it, young man. So he ran home. He grabbed every penny he had, ran back to the store, threw them all over the counter. I want my boat. As he left the store, he took that little boat and he held it to his chest and he said, little boat, now you're twice mine. First I made you, and then I bought you back. You know, the story of that little boat, it's the story of you and me. And this scene on a hill far away tells us of a, a perfectly just, perfectly sovereign, perfectly righteous God who made us. And it tells us a, of a God of his love and mercy who made us and then bought us back. And I believe God told us this story so that we could respond in faith like that second thief. We can hear that same thing, those same words that Jesus spoke to him, today you will be with me in paradise. And I just want to ask you one question as we look forward to this Passion Week. Next Sunday we'll come together, celebrate the, the resurrection of Jesus, and we think about all those things that he did for us, the cross that he went to for us. And the question for you to consider this morning, is will you respond to his call today? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this display. Lord, you didn't have to tell us about this story. You could have passed this by in our celebration of your love for us on Calvary. Our celebration of your resurrection from the dead wouldn't be missing one single thing if you passed this story by. But you chose us to you chose to tell us this story. All four gospels. 
you chose to tell us this story. So that we would know about who you are and display of your justice, your righteousness, your love and your mercy. Father, as we come to this time of invitation, I realize there may be one here this morning. Deep down inside, they know they have not heard those words from you. You will be with me in paradise. They don't have that kind of assurance that if today were the day they would pass over into eternity, they would stand there with you. And Father, as we enter this time of invitation, Lord, I pray that you would continue to speak to that one heart, that they would respond to you today to make today their day of salvation. Father, there are aspects of your character that we've often forgotten. And Father, I pray even as we come into this, this time of invitation for your children that are here this morning, Lord, let this continue to be a time where you speak to our hearts and you lead us. Help us to respond to you, I pray in Jesus' name.